introduction to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. That's all we're going to do tonight, by the way. It says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So we'll explain all that because I want to tell you about, there's a lot just in that first verse. That first verse is going to be our introduction. So any good journalist knows the six basic questions that need to be answered to give or write a report or any, or on any type of aspect. Does anybody know what they are? What are the six questions journalists are taught to ask? Oh, you guys are good. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. So I'm going to answer the first four tonight about Isaiah. I'm going to answer the who, what, where, and when of Isaiah. So, uh, the first thing I'm going to answer is the who. As an introduction to the book of Isaiah tonight, I want to answer those first four questions. So we'll start with the who. The who questions are talking about Isaiah. Who is this Isaiah? I mean, where does he come from? What do we know about him? Well, you'll be surprised to understand, to find out what we know. The answer to this question of who Isaiah is is simply stated in, in verse 1. The vision of of Isaiah, the son of Amos. That's what we're told. We're not told his mother's name. We're not told anybody else's name. We're told he's the son of Amos. But if you search scripture, you're going to find out a lot about that. I'll tell you a little bit first. The facts, the facts that come with his name. Isaiah means the Lord is salvation, um, which is the main theme of his prophecy. That's what you're going to get out of the entire prophecy. The Lord is salvation. If you come to the Lord, he's going to save you no matter what happens. And I'm not just talking about salvation of asking Jesus as your Savior, but save you from any calamity that's coming, save you from the terror that's coming, save you from uh, the possibilities of the world coming against you. He's named at birth prophetically as, a, as Isaiah. We're not told how his mother decided on the name, but his mother would decide on the name. Jewish mothers decided the name, not the fathers. Um, was it a visit from an angel, maybe like Mary had? Or maybe she was a devout woman and felt that she was urged by God to name her baby after the one she worshipped? We don't know. Uh, names carry a great significance, though, for those who bear them. And you may not know it, but a name, a name that you have on a resume could either get you a job or make you not get a job based on your name. Uh, many prejudices come because of names. Uh, the, the, more, the, the stranger name sounds, the less likely you are to be hired by someone. Uh, so the people tend to gravitate to names that they understand, not the names they don't understand. So names mean a whole lot. Uh, renowned sociologists and psychologists tell us that the name we bear often affects our sense of self-worth and our roles in life. Let me give you an example. They say a boy named Max will, will uh, react differently to life than a boy named jo Josiah. Uh, and there's obvious reasons. Max is more of a masculine name. So who, Josiah is a biblical name. So you'll take that moniker with you. And if somebody's not biblical and they see your name Josiah, uh, they may think of you in a different way. Uh, or a girl named Crystal will see herself differently than a girl named Mabel. Uh, Mabel will view herself as someone that's from a different generation. And so naming our children has a lot to do with them coming, coming about in life and how they, how they react to life. Even nicknames we bear shape our identity. The, the uh, sociologist is going to say this, a crippled child who is nicknamed Limpy by cruel kids at school uh, with, it, can also see his friends who are maybe overweight called Fatso. They bears, the, bears down hard on them, on their childhood identity that can last long into adulthood. The opposite side of that is true also. Sociologists tell us that if someone's called Limpy or Fatso, they actually have an identity and they're even better off than somebody who has a non-identity type of name, even though that sounds weird. It's one of the reasons you see name changes in scripture, you see them all over the place. Uh, you'll see God is my refuge. God is my judge is what Daniel means. L is the prefix for God. L is God. So God is my judge. His name was changed to Belteshazzar. Bel protected his life. False God when he went to Babylon. We know that Hananiah was Yahweh has been gracious. His name was named to Shadrach. Most likely command of Aku, another false God. Who is like God is Mishael. Look at the L, oh God. A Meshach, who is his name was changed. Who is, who, who is what? Eku is, another false god of Babylon. Yahweh helps is Azariah. Uh, Abednego, his name's changed too, a distortion of the servant of Nebo. So you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are their, those are their Babylonian names. Those are their, those are their pagan names. The real names, if you look at scripture, was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Even Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. So in the ancient Near East, names and their connotation form part of a person's identity. Remember, we're talking about the first question, who? Who is Isaiah? Uh, obliterating any reference to the Hebrew God was the goal in, in uh, Babylon. Substituting names alluding to references of Babylonian gods. Nebuchadnezzar did not compel the Hebrew youth to renounce their faith in favor of idolatry, but he hoped to bring this about gradually, specifically by changing their names. We also see that God changes names in Scripture. 
some of them in the Bible, uh, a Abram meant father. Abraham, his name was changed, would mean father of many. Sarai was princess. She becomes Sarah, mother of nations. Jacob means deceiver. To Israel, struggle with God. Remember I told you we have two natures? Many times you'll see that in Scripture. You have a Jacob nature, which is your old man, and you have an Israel nature, which is your spiritual man. Hosea means salvation, was changed to Joshua, the Lord of salvation. Simon, Reed, was changed to Peter, rock. Some Simon, or Simon, uh, is also talked about small pebble. So it could be either translated reed or small pebble. So we know those name changes uh, were definitely used in Scripture. So in any case, we may never know how Isaiah got his name, but we do know the result. To be known by the name that means the Lord is salvation is to set the prophet apart as a man of destiny. And from his birth, he understands that. It's not like us. You know, a lot of times when we want a name for our child, we, people used to go to soap operas and you see kids running around with the same name as some lady's favorite guy on soap operas. Or they go to a baby book, a name book, and they pick out a name. But these were studied. They weren't named until eight days after they were born. And so they watched them. Laban means white. And so Laban must have had some white complexion, very, very white complexion. So we see a lot. Jacob means, you see it right here, Jacob means deceiver. So from a very early age, maybe his mother saw him taking something as a baby and just pulling it somewhere or something. So maybe it was a look in his eye. But they named them based on their characteristics they saw or what God had instructed them to name them. And so many times it's, it's basically that way in Scripture. So... Despite the impression of his name and his reputation as the greatest of all Old Testament prophets, and he was, we know very little about him. We know extremely little about Isaiah. What we do know is what he also tells us about who, the who question in verse 1. He is the son of Amos. Now, most people will read that and pass right by it. But that tells us something about Isaiah that's really noteworthy. Matter of fact, it's going to stick with you tonight because it stuck with me when I started studying it. Again, our knowledge of Amos is very limited. What we do know, you ready? Is that Isaiah's father Amos is royalty. He's directly related to the kings of Judah. So, you have Jehoram, king of Judah, Ahaziah, king of Judah, Athaliah, king of Judah, Zibna, king of Judah. But from Joash comes Amos. Amos is, is not a king, but he's directly, he's royal blood. And his son is also royal blood. Now, why does that mean something? Well, I'm going to tell you, this is very, very important. Now that changes everything because that means that Isaiah, his son, is of royal blood. He has, he's a blue blood. So, he's, so as a son of Amos, with royal blood running through his veins, Isaiah enjoyed the privilege of immediate access into the royal court and the presence of the king. So watch. While Isaiah prophesied and spoke to the masses of people in Judah and Jerusalem and sub surrounding nations, the throne room of the king was his bully pulpit. They could not throw him out of the throne room. He was royalty. God had placed Isaiah and his word his, in the pinnacle of power in Judah. And the king, as the king went, we know in scripture, so did the nation. We hear about wicked kings. We hear about good kings. As that king went, that's when, that's when the nation. The king was wicked and had idolatry. The nation went into idolatry. We know all of Israel's kings, 20 of them, were wicked. Uh, they were in idolatry. But we know some of them in Judah, eight of them, were good kings. They were kings that followed God. So as Isaiah spoke to the king's ear, obviously the king has a direct access to the word of God and the prophecies of God. How many think that's important? Okay, watch. It makes you wonder if God has anybody he has chosen that has access to the president of the United States. Maybe you and I don't know something that's going on with the president of the United States and maybe with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Maybe there's an advisor there that you and I don't know that the news doesn't know, that God is specifically placed there. You think, President, you think President Trump came up with it all by himself to make Jerusalem the capital of Israel? Do you think he came up with it all by himself to recognize Golan? There is somebody in his court that God has put there. I believe that with all my heart. It's exactly what happened with Isaiah. Isaiah's in the court to change the hearts of the king and to change his nation. So how many are learning it a little bit tonight? That right there is probably one of the most powerful things you'll ever hear. And I'm going to just prove it to you in a moment uh, just by something that he does. So let me give you, the, give you the next question. Next question is what? What's he speaking? What's he saying? What has God given him? Well, what is Isaiah's message? Again, the answer is in verse 1. The vision. Isaiah is not saying something out of his head. He is seeing something. He's getting a vision from God. Many visions. God's giving him visions and he's writing what he's seen. So I want you to understand that the content of his message will come from visions from God. By announcing his message as a vision, Isaiah ta takes any opinion he may have out of the mix. If I wrote to the president today, I'm going to give him my opinion. 
and I'm going to give him some things the Bible says. This is none of Isaiah's opinion. None of it at all. He's quoting and speaking. His text is right from the vision. It's right from what he sees. Similar to John the Revelator. Revelation is the vision of God given to John. John writes down the vision. That's exactly what Isaiah is doing. This is not just, that's why he's called the greatest Old Testament prophet. He's not just writing his feelings that God would, can give him through the Holy Spirit. He's writing something he's seeing. He's writing a vision of something. And by the way, Isaiah writes a vision past our day. He writes a vision of, of Messiah coming back. And uh, so he's writing something he's actually seen that we haven't even experienced yet. That's part of his message way down towards the end. So by, by again, announcing his message as a vision, Isaiah takes any op opinion he may have out of the mix. God's message will come through Isaiah through a vision, not a fax, not a text message, not some feelings, not what he's observing around him. It's coming directly from the vision of God. He report what he has given and what he sees coming. But God also warned him that when he gave him the text of what to say based on the vision, that the people, masses of the people of Judah and Jerusalem, would stop their ears, they'd close their eyes, and they'd harder in their hearts. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. These people would reject everything he said, every single thing he said. Now, watch. And here's an interesting fact. The lack of people receiving the truth that Isaiah was giving became a test of Isaiah's faithfulness to God. It was a confirmation. Isaiah knew he was doing God's work because people were rejecting him. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine being a minister and doing that? How many preachers do you know or do you think would help keep on preaching if no one listened to them or no one showed up? This makes me think of Noah. Noah continued to preach righteousness for 120 years, but nobody listened to him. This is Isaiah. No one's listening to him. You know what? When I'm studying this and when I'm reading it, I'm thinking, God, we need some Isaiahs. We need somebody that nobody, they're not going to listen to him. We need some bold Isaiahs that will say things that are not politically correct, that will say things because God's given him a, a, a mandate to do that. And his confirmation was he knew he was doing God's will by the amount of people that rejected him. Isn't that weird? It's kind of strange. So, he even walked naked through the streets of Jerusalem for three years as a symbol of the coming Babylonian exile. And there's a lot of people that call themselves prophets today. I wonder how many would be able to subject themselves to that. Actually, it tells us in Scripture. And we'll talk about this when we get there in, in chapter 20, because it's not necessarily everything you think, but it is what you think also. At the same time, spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins. Sa loin. Sackcloth was, you repent. God bless you. Sackcloth is when you repented in sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth was picky. And so what you did, you took off your normal clothes, you wore sackcloth so you could feel this, this physical pain so that you can repent. That's a type of repentance. So he says, it's time for you to stop repenting. That's what God told him. Take the sackcloth off. I don't want you to go naked in front of them from thy loins and put off thy shoes from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot, prophesying to Israel. So he has an amazing prophecy. I mean, he's very, very dedicated to this prophecy and to what he has to say. So we will explore that again when we go in chapter 22. So the radical Isaiah matched the radical message that God was giving him. Except for his encounter with God in the temple, chapter 6, you know, he saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. You remember that one. Isaiah gives very, very little additional information about who he is. Uh, there is a limited biological information about him in that book. As a matter of fact, towards the end of the book, he never says anything about himself at all. Even in his accounts, he, pres he presents himself as a worshiping, confessing, and very needy creature who responds to the call of God and will speak his truth in spite of overall rejection by the people. Uh, in short, he is politically incorrect, totally rejected, and amazingly not phased by the reaction he gets from others. Wow, do we need an Isaiah in our world today? In our pulpits, I think we do. So after two or three episodes in which he met with King Ahaz and Hezekiah, Isaiah himself disappears from this scene. After this, all the prophecies of the future exile and restoration of Israel are without the author's personal identification. And because of this, some scholars push a theory of two or three Isaiahs. Say there, you know, it's just one book combined by two or three authors. Uh, because of the absence of his personal identification in, verses, in chapters 40 through chapter 66. You won't hear anything about him from chapter 40 to chapter 66. So that's the second book. Uh, when somebody says that to you, that's not true, and I'm going to tell you why. Quite the opposite is true. These chapters are events seen far beyond his time, even beyond your time. So he keeps himself out of them, and as you'll see, they are last day's prophecies yet to be fulfilled. It's not about whether or not his name appears in the text, but rather is he consistent throughout these ca chapters? And indeed he is. He is the, he's writing the same way as he did in the first several chapters. Which brings us to the third question. When? When did he write these things? Well, if I could show you this, and I'm going to have to give, go slow on this one because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of timelines here. 
So if you see, here's the flood. Here's the move to Egypt. There's the Exodus. There's the United Kingdom. There's Judges. There's the Kingdom Divides. There's Judah destroyed. Exiles return. Isaiah's writing right over in here. He's writing somewhere around 700 BC. The kingdom is divided. He is writing to, he's writing to Judah and uh, Jerusalem. He, uh, I'll show you this again. So if you see it, 700 to 600, there's Isaiah. Isaiah's writing right in here. Here's the other rest of the books of your Bible. Joshua is about 1400 BC. Judges spans from 1400 to 1100. First and Second Chronicles, First Kings, First, and, First Chronicles, First Kings, First Samuel, Second Samuel. That's the reigns of David and, and uh, Saul and Solomon. Then you'll see Second Kings, Second Chronicles. There's all the all the prophets and the timelines they wrote on. So Isaiah is a contemporary of Obadiah and Haggai, and he's writing right around here. These are restoration prophets, as I showed you in the long in the long timeline we showed. Let me give you this one. So if you look at it, there you got 722. He's writing to Judah. And Judah is the southern part of, of the split nation of Israel. Israel, ten nations to the, to the north. Samaria is their capital. Judah, two nations, to the, two tribes to the south. I should say ten tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. Uh, we know Judah and Benjamin. And he's writing to them in Jerusalem. Although his writing and his prophecy is going to go all the way through the land, he's specifically writing to them. And he's talking, going to be talking about Assyrian judgment. His contemporary is Micah. So if you want to read Micah, Micah and Isaiah speak about the exact same time. So they're talking the exact same, same thing. So after Isaiah, you should probably read Micah and see what he has to say. Um, as we see this, let me give you one last one. I know there's a lot of charts. Uh, this is Isaiah right over here. Isaiah is going to talk about, he's going to, he's going to be able to prophesy through King Uzziah, King Jotham, King Ahaz, King Hezekiah. Notice three of them are good kings. One of them's not going to listen. He's not going to last very long. But Isaiah and Micah are talking to them. And Isaiah is in the courtroom of all four of those. His, his ministry spans four kings, four kings of Judah. So he has a voice, the four kings. He obviously influ influences three of them because three of them become good kings of Judah. One of them doesn't listen. He doesn't last very long. So uh, starting in four, about 740 BC, BC, his ministry lasted 71 years. 71 years. That is massive, especially in the Old Testament. He is many times called the Old Testament evangelist. His book can be divided into two divisions. Uh, before I give you that one, let me give you one last chart, okay? This again, Isaiah, Judah alone. So we see Judah right there. We see Michael over here. So we know that the rulers of the world were Egypt, then Assyria, then Babylon, and then Persia. He knows, and he's going to write, of a Babylonian captivity coming. His warnings are to Israel that has gone away from God, saying there's a, there's a captivity coming, there's an exile coming. You're going to be destroyed because you're going against God. So how many get a little more of understanding of Isaiah? Raise those hands, let me see. So he's writing them, he's warning them. You know, we talk about, and I'm going to step, stop here for a second, we talk about God judging America. I think the judgment should come tomorrow. How many think that? God is slow to lose patience. That judgment may be, you may have a prophet today telling that. I mean, you may have me saying it's going to happen. I believe judgment's coming on America. I don't, I don't care what anybody else says, I believe it's coming. That doesn't have to happen tomorrow. That doesn't have to happen two years from now. Should the Lord tarry, it can happen a long time. God takes his time. In Isaiah's time, he took his time. 71 years he was prophesying that a destruction was coming. And it did come. So let me just tell you. So he's the Old Testament evangelist. His book can be divided into two divisions. And I don't think I'm even there yet. Um... Well, let me see if I can get you this one. Okay, can be divided into two divisions. Well, let me get one last one before I get there. So, three periods of Judah under which Isaiah prophesied. Number one, the reign of King Uzziah and King Jotham. That was one part. Uh, more freedom without much Assyrian pressure. Assyria wasn't really given a whole lot of pressure. But the military and political politi a political system of Assyria, who was ruling the world, was pressuring Israel. They're coming at them. You remember Tilgath Piazar, he was a general. Shalmaneser, Sargon, and Sennacherib. Remember Sennacherib? You heard about him in scripture. He's a general that's going to surround Jerusalem and he's going to be the last one. He's going to be the one that takes down Jerusalem. He's going to, under King Hezekiah. So he's been prophesying Isaiah under, under Uzziah and King Jotham, in the reign of King Ahaz and the reign of King Hezekiah. He's telling him something's coming. He's telling all the people something's coming. He's giving very specifics. The first part of the book of Isaiah is pretty tough. It's pretty tough to hear. It has, he's divided into two divisions with three main areas of focus. Let me show it to you. So the three main areas of focus would be this. And again, don't get bamboozled by this whole thing. Division 1 is chapters 1 to 39. He's going to give you a prophetic understanding and a historic understanding. Then Division 2 from 40 to 66, as I mentioned before, are messianic prophecies. And he's going to tell you about the Messiah. He's going to tell you about a time even beyond us. So even though he talks about judgment, he talks about the answer to that judgment coming with, with the messi messianic prophecies. So 
in the first part, 1 to 35, he talks to Judah, Israel, and the nations, chiefly ministry of the conscience of Israel and Judah, suffering under God's hand in government, with the Messiah coming as the goal of blessing before them. So ordered, orderly, connected series of messages or burdens, evidently uttered by Isaiah before the, the uh, illness of Hezekiah. You'll remember Hezekiah gets ill, Isaiah helps him uh, add some years to his life. And so the Assyrian period is what it's called. You see, this is what we'll be studying in here. Woes, the songs, uh, Babylon, Philistine, Philistia, Philistia, Moab, then the historical, through the prophetical and typical characteristics showing, uh, showing how for Judah, all blessings are bound up with the son of David, who came down through the thread but is raised up by an omnip omnipotent power. And it's almost identical with 2 Kings. And we'll talk about that. The anticipation of the Babylons, the recollection of Syrian invasion. And then this is the messianic part. This is the part you're going to get very excited on towards the end of the, uh, end of the study. So uh, it's pretty powerful. It's worthwhile to note also that the prof prophecy that spoke as bold, the prophets that spoke as boldly as Isaiah did were usually killed within the first two years of their prophecies. Or they were beheaded or were banished. Isaiah is lasting 71 years. Anybody know any reason why? Two reasons. God's protection. What else? He's royalty. They can't kill him. He's royalty. You can't go against royalty. And so he's preserved by his, by his heritage and he's preserved by God. So let me add that. There is a relationship between the call of ministry and the, the per perseverance or the length of ministry, even today. So Isaiah has a very long ministry. And I'm going to tell you some st statistics today about pastors. I'm going to make a statement I really believe and I'm going to stand by. There is a relationship between how you're called into ministry and the perseverance or the length of your ministry. Does anybody understand what I'm saying there? There is a relationship between how you're called, the strength of your call, and how much you stay in the ministry. There's a relationship. So uh, the, those pastors which are the strong, have the strongest sense of divine call are the ones who stay in the ministry the longest. Some pastors I've met, they, did, they went in the ministry for a lot of different reasons. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some pastors, they have a massive call and they're going to be in that ministry because that's, they, they have a pushing, they have an urging, they have a call. So, let me give you some statistics that you're going to be a little bit shocked by. And I'm going to quote, I'm going to tell you a little bit myself personally through these two. This is today's pastors. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention with their churches. 50% of pastors' marriages will end in divorce. 50%. It's no different than the general public. 80% of pastors feel unqualified and discouraged in their role as pastor. I can't tell you how many pastors have called me from Alabama and other states telling me they're discouraged. They'll call me because I'm a contemporary of theirs, that they respect me or they know me. And they'll tell me they're discouraged. And they'll, and they'll read me these things that are going on in their lives and, and tell me these things are going on. It fits all these statistics I'm telling you. 50% of pastors are so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could, but have no other way of making a living. Do you know how many pastors have told me, Pastor, I would get out of ministry tomorrow, but I, don't ha I can't do anything else to make a living. This is things that most lay people don't know. I mean, if it is said, listen, from pulpit and pew research, 76% of clergy were either overweight or obese, 10% being depressed, I'll tell you why. 40% said they were depressed at times or worn out, some or most of the time. Now, I'm not going to build myself up. That's not why I'm here today, tonight, but I'm going to tell you, because I can personally describe this. I have never been depressed in the pastorate. Matter of fact, I've never been depressed. And I respect people, and I understand, I have a compassion for people who are depressed, but the pastorate has never depressed me. And that's not saying that I've always had an easy street in the pastorate. It's just that there's a calling. And that calling was very, very strong. And it's not because of, of situations. I wasn't called because of situations. There's a lot of pastors like that, but not, but not that many. Listen to the statistics. 80% of seminary and Bible graduates who enter the ministry will leave the ministry within the first five years. So obviously, were they called? Or were they depressed? Or how strong was their calling? 70% of pastors constantly fight depression. 70%. Almost 40% polls said they have had an extramarital affair since beginning their ministry. And I have never had an extramarital affair. 70% said the only time they spend studying the Word is when they are preparing their sermons. That's sad because they don't have a big daily Bible study. This is polled. These are pastors they are polled. So here's the typical profile of a pastor. Before I get to that, let me tell you this. I'm in a program right now called, um, what is it called, Brian? For St. Vincent's. Yes, you do. You're in it. You don't know what it's called? It's the <laughs> There's a program here in St. Vincent's, Clergy Wellness. Thank you. There's a program here called Clergy Wellness. What they do for me and anybody who wants to do, because they've taken the statistics and they know the pastors are overweight, they're stressed, they lack any, edu lack any uh, 
they're sedimentary lifestyle. They lack any physical training or any physical abilities that they do, which, again, I haven't in my life because I've kept myself active. But because of that, they freely give membership to this gym or any gym around Birmingham. This gym is about $6,000 a year. They give you a personal trainer. They give you lunch and learns that you have to go every other Friday uh, that tells you different things medically. And they uh, give you, I guess, what else is it, Brian? Something else they give you. And they feed you. And so that is free for a year so that they can get the clergy in better condition because they know if the clergy is in a better condition, their congregation will be in a better condition. Now, I take advantage of it because it was offered to me. But there's some people that are in there that really need it because they've never had any exercise or anything. Listen to the typical profile of a pastor. The typical pastor in America is a 51-year-old male with symptoms of depression. The patient has high blood pressure, is overweight, presenting a heightened risk of heart disease and other illnesses. He works 60 to 70 hours a week in a sedentary job, does not currently engage in any physical exercise, and reports considerable work-related stress. The patient is married with three children, one of whom expresses interest in following the patient's career path. The patient expresses little enthusiasm for encouraging the child to do so. That's your typical pastor in America. They're under a lot of stress. And I think a lot of it is because, and I'm not saying all of it, a lot of it is because the call really wasn't a call. It was a profession. It was something they wanted to get into. I had a guy come to my house the other day that I pastored. He lives in the same development. I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he came to my house and he said, uh, he was doing some other job. I won't tell what, in case you know him. He said, uh, Pastor Mark, he said, you know, I said, how's the job going? He said, well, I lost that job. He said, I'm not doing it anymore. And he said, uh, I was thinking of getting into the ministry. He said, how much does it pay? And I said, what? And he said, how much? He said, Look, you know, you have a nice house. looks like you do pretty well. And I said, how much is a passive? First of all, this house and what I have is not based on what I earned in the ministry. I've done a lot of other things. I said, secondly, if you're getting into the ministry because of how much it pays, you'll be out of it real quick. It's because the ministry many times doesn't pay a whole lot. My first ministry, I had to give up a very lucrative job. I went to the ministry and I got $100 a week. I would, my car would run out of gas as I went to the house of the treasurer to get my check. And uh, she gloated her over me. She knew I was going to run out of gas and just waited for me to get to her. She wouldn't come meet me. She waited for me. But I needed that. I mean, it was a training ground for me. I paid myself with my two kids at the time and Cheryl to be in the ministry. My calling had nothing to do with money. It had to do with a passion that God gave me. And so the, the whole idea of Isaiah, think about the passion he has. Can you imagine getting up every day and being rejected and people throwing things at you and people wanting to put you in prison or do whatever they could, although they couldn't touch you because you're royalty, but they're still slandering you and calling you all kinds of names. You don't have a friend on the planet. His call had to be pretty powerful. Well, you'll read about it in, in Isaiah chapter 6. He has a vision of God in the temple and an angel flies to him with, with a burning coal and sticks it on his tongue. Let me tell you something. Isaiah is going to be a, going to be a minister till the day he dies because he has a passion that's come with it. So there's a big difference. Uh, Jesus called them hirelings, people that have come into the ministry and they don't have the call of the ministry. If you don't have the call and you're in the ministry, you are absolutely crazy. You're either crazy or called. I promise you. If you're in the ministry, it's nothing that you would think was so rewarding because it's not. It's hard. It's tough. Uh, so if you're in the ministry and you think you're, it's because of money, you're going to get burned out pretty quick. And by the way, again, not personal pride. I've never been burned out in the ministry, ever. And that doesn't mean that I didn't have problems. It doesn't mean that I didn't face things. Uh, there's times that I wish I could go back and make more time for my family at times. But I never had a burnout because I, my calling was so fiery. My calling was so about face. And there's a lot of men like that. And I'm not saying they, they have to have that fiery call, but statistics tell us that if you do, that your ministry is going to last all the way. One out of every 10 ministers retire as a minister. Just one out of every 10. The rest of them find another profession. So, you still with me tonight? All right. Let me, let me uh, repeat. Those pastors with the strongest sense of divine call are the ones who, who stayed in the ministry the longest. Look how Isaiah answered God's call. Isaiah 6 eight. Then one of the seraphim flew to me holding the live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed. He said, he said he was a sinner. Uh, he said he was a sinner before this. And your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. That's his calling. Okay, so Isaiah has this massive vision about his calling. Then he says this. He says, Well, how long do you want me to do this? <laughs> I've said that so many times. God, how long do you want me to stay in the ministry? Listen. How long... O oh Lord, and he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitants, houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. 
and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. He's saying, I want you to do this until the Babylonian exile, until there's nobody left. By the way, Isaiah dies. He never goes to Babylon. He's old and he dies right before they go to Babylon. His ministry for, was for the rest of his life. Man, how many are learning a little bit tonight? Here am I, send me. Then how long, O Lord? Who could ever forget such a, a calling? Both God and Isaiah stayed true to their change. Lastly, where? Where did he do this? Where did he speak? Well, primarily, it was here. The southern part, which is Judah, specifically Jerusalem. But his words are going to go through to Israel also. They know where the prophets are. So we see he's in the southern kingdom. Now, primarily to the chosen nation of Judah. They were the chosen nation. By the way, when he was prophesying, when he started, um, the northern nation has already been taken captive by Assyria, 586 B.C., so they're already gone. There's nobody left in the northern nation except the Samaritans, which are an interbred between Assyrian generals and J Jewish women. So even though they're hearing him up there, they're not the remnant. The remnant is in Judah. So he's speaking to the last remnant that's there. So listen, Israel is the center, the geographical center of the landmass of planet Earth. Physically, it's the geographical center. Jerusalem is in the geographical center of Israel. And Israel and Solomon's temple is in the center of Jerusalem. In the center of Solomon's temple is the Ark of the Covenant. It's the epicenter of the world. Isaiah is sent to the heart of the world, the spiritual, the spiritual pulse of the world, to resuscitate it, to spark it back to life. You know, I tell this to people all the time when they ask about America and about the church. I believe the church in America is the sleeping giant. I believe if you ever wake that sleeping giant, this nation's going to have revival like crazy. But the sleeping giant is listening to all different kinds of things. The church is progressive. It has different things going on. If the church ever got a revival back, if they ever got the, the spark back in them, I'm talking about the church universal in America. If the Christian church ever got that spark, we are a sleeping giant. Do you know how many Christians, people call themselves Christians are in America? There's quite a few. And we are the sleeping giant. If that giant ever woke up, Man, we can change this nation again. This is what Isaiah's trying to do. He's trying to wake that sleeping giant because God still loves America. Somebody say amen. He loves America. He's not going to abandon America. He loves Israel. Israel's 88% secular. One day Israel's going to wake up. It's going to spark back to life. We know that 144,000 are going to stand on Mount Zion and they're going to create a revival. They're not the Jehovah Witnesses. Trust me. They're going to be saved Jews, male virgin Jews. They're going to spark a revival, Revelation tells us. And all Israel, Roman, uh, Romans, Paul tells us in Romans, will be saved. So imagine if that could happen in America. It's not going to happen be because of some huge TV televangelist. It's not going to happen because of some popular Christian. That's an oxymoron, by the way to be a popular Christian. Isaiah wasn't a popular, a popular believer. Uh, he was a believer, but he wasn't a popular Jew. He was an unpopular Jew who's saying a very unpopular message. He was saying the message of God. God's message is not always popular. It's not always politically correct. It's repent. Come on, I don't know if you know that. It's a tough word, but that's what God's message is. Do you think America has to repent for anything? Somebody, so raise your hand if you think America has to repent. Of course we do. We have to repent for a whole lot of stuff. So just listen. It's an age-old story. Judah is in decline. I've showed this over and over again. I'm going to give it to you one more time. Here's what happens to nations. It also happens to people, by the way. What happens is Israel serves the Lord. Israel fall, I'm using Israel, but it could be used as Judah too, by the way. And it could be used as any church or any nation, America. Israel falls into sin and idolatry. God warns through prophets of coming judgment. Enter Isaiah. Israel's oppressed. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises up a judge. This is about judges when they had him. Israel's delivered. America serves the Lord. America falls into sin and idolatry. By the way, serving the Lord right in between sin and idolatry is, is uh, prosperous. You prosper. Israel falls into sin and idolatry usually because of their prosperity. Uh, God gives up a, gives a prophets of coming judgment. America is oppressed somehow. America cries out to the Lord. America, God raises up someone that's respected in America uh, spiritually. America is delivered. America serves the Lord. It's a, cir it's a circle. It's a cycle. We are right now in... If, in sin and idolatry. We are not going to escape a judgment. And there's got to be somebody soon coming around that tells us it's going to happen. Maybe it's just me here, but it's got to tell somebody sooner or later it's going to happen unless we repent. When my people who are called by my name humble themselves and repent, seek my face, I will heal their land. You can't get away from it. It's God's word. No matter how much love you want to put with God, God is love, but great love, if you love your children, you're going to discipline them when they're wrong. Who God loves, the Bible says, he chastens. And so we know that America is not following God. I mean, we are, we are not. I'm not talking about everyone. I'm talking about America as a nation. So it's where God continues to center his word, even today in Israel, by the way. Uh, as you will see, Isaiah's prophecies will prefigure the ministry of Jesus, starting with the nation of Judah and Jerusalem. Like ripples in a pond, both Jesus' preaching and Isaiah's prophecies will reach to all surrounding nations and will stretch to all generations in the future on a global scale. Consequently, even, even though Judah was rebellious, now listen, 
Neither God nor Isaiah ever gave up on them. And you can't give up on America. I would never give up on America. With every woe that Isaiah pronounces, there follows hope. For every curse, there's a cure. For every warning, there's an encouragement. Isaiah spoke such great things in his book that we learned this. Isaiah was a great man, trustworthy in his vision. In his days, the sun went backwards. God stopped time. He lengthened the life of a king, Hezekiah. By the power of the Spirit, he saw the last things beyond you and me. He comforted the mourners in Zion. He comforted those like us, who see a nation that's going wrong, and we say, God, what are we going to do? You know, the end to us is not our political, our political mechanisms in America. The end to us is trusting God. He comforted mourners in Zion. He revealed what was to occur at the end of time and hidden things long before they happened. This is Isaiah. Now, I leave you with some facts and some, some boom, boom, boom charts. Okay, can I do that? It's going to be one after another. I'm going to overload you. And then we'll get slow down and I'll close for you. So let me give you a couple charts as far as introduction. Written by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. He's called the Dean of the Prophets, the Paul of the Old Testament. It's the Gospel, according to Isaiah, as you'll see in a moment. The Messianic Prophet. It's written to Judah and Jerusalem. They had become very proud. They allied themselves with the Syria to avoid destruction. They were compromising to avoid destruction. By the way, we're compromising today. Whether it's with the LGBT community. I'm not talking about fired up church members. I'm talking about our nation as a whole. We're compromising sin. Isaiah was preacher to the kings, a, statement, a statesman reformer. It was written about 740 to 700 BC over a period of 40 to 60 years. That's when it was written, but his, his prophecy spanned probably 70 years. Some people shorten it to 40. It's 70. During the reigns of four kings of Judah, about 200 years after the zenith under David and Solomon. So David and Zol Solomon had a, had a powerful kingdom, but then it deteriorated after it split. Starting about 37 years before Israel fell to Assyria. 37 years before Israel fell to Assyria. That's the northern kingdom. About 150 years before Judah fell to Babylon. Contemporary with Micah to the south, Hosea and Amos to the north. They all lived at the same time. Zoh Isaiah. His mission and message was salvation, the same as his name. Only, the, word only, the word occurs 28 times in Isaiah, the word salvation. Only nine times in other prophetic books combined. So this is a message of salvation, of, of protection under God. Isaiah's name and the names of his sons give an overview of the entire book. Isaiah's name means salvation is of the Lord. God is the source of salvation. His first son, Jashir, uh, Shir Jashub, is a remnant will return. It's a promise. Uh, God will spare a remnant for himself. And his second son, Meher Shalah Hashbaz, by the way, the longest name in the Bible, the longest word in the Bible, means booty or, or the treasure will very quickly be taken. That's God's judgment coming. All your prosperity will be taken very quickly. He names his sons based on his prophecies. Isaiah's vision revealed Isaiah's heart. Here I am, send me. He knew that it was going to be tough, but he asked God to do it. Introduction again, purpose of Isaiah's prophecy. To rebuke the sins of the people and call upon them to repent, return to God and do His will. To warn Judah of the impending doom because of their unfaithfulness to God. To remind the people, trust in the Lord for their protection and deliverance. To teach that salvation will come only from God, never from men. To proclaim the glorious hope of Messiah's coming, the establishment of His eternal kingdom, and the salvation He would bring to all nations. It's a miniature Bible. Here's what gets really amazing to me. It has 66 chapters. 66 books in the Bible. It has two main divisions. One under 39 chapters and the other 27. Just like the Old Testament and the New Testament. First 39 chapters are God's judgment upon immoral and idolatrous men. A man's condemnation, helpless state, and need for Redeemer. The last 27 chapters are the grace of God and the message of hope in the promise of the Redeemer to save His people. God's assurance and redemption from captivity to bring His people home and the coming of Messiah and Savior King. Look at this. The first 39 chapters, which would be parallel to the Old Testament, talks about God's judgment, the wrath of God. The second, the 27 chapters, which would be the New Testament, talks about God's grace. How many of you see it? It is the Bible in miniature. It's the entire Bible in miniature. It's a powerful book. Isaiah is referenced 43 times in the New Testament, second only to Psalms. As we go a little further, um, the visions of the book, I told you, prophetic, chapters 1 to 35, historic, chapters 36 to 39, messianic, the Holy One redeems, comforts, and assures His people, Israel's restoration from exile. If I go a little bit further, the, he talks about the character of God, the righteousness and justice of God, filled with Zion, filled Zion with justice and righteousness, the glory of God. He's high and lifted up, 6-1. The Lord is exalted. He dwells on high. He reigns from His throne in heaven, the excellency of our God, the holiness of God, Holy One of Israel, 25 times in the book, 6 times in the rest of the Old Testament, 25 times in His book. He is in, incomparable. Uh, consequences for rejecting His holiness, and God cannot tolerate sin. And it's true, he cannot. 
Um, character of Judah, rebellious, ungrateful. They forgot the source of their blessings. Damascus and Samaria, too. He throws them in. That's Syria, by the way. Hypocritical. Worship God, but perverted justice by taking bribes. Oppressed the poor widows and the orphans. Erred through wine and strong drink. Revolted in their own hands, making idols. Practiced ungodliness. Uttered error. Devised wickedness. Complacent, at ease about their sinf sinful condition. Man, think about America. Obstinate with a neck of iron muscle and brow of brass. Draw near with their mouths, honor with their lips. That means that they're going through the motions of being godly, but they're not. Mistakenly thought God would accept uh, external actions without internal devotions. Fred, I think you're asking. God said, I'm sick of all your offerings in Isaiah, so keep them. I'm sick of your new moons. I'm sick of your festivals. I'm sick of you going to church. That's what God says. I am sick of you worshiping me. Because they, they were doing one thing with their, with their actions and another thing with, one thing with their mouth and another thing with their actions. The character of Judah, proud, full of themselves and their great possessions, military strength, military alliances, had lofty looks, displayed haughtiness, acted arrogance of heart, became wise in their own eyes, would call evil good and good evil, visited mediums and wizards instead of God. By the way, 1-900 numbers for the future telling is at an all-time high record num number of money in America. Told the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy the seats. That's our churches today. And again, not all of them. They tickle people's ears. They tell them what they want to hear. It's called a progressive church. Tell us what we want to hear. Don't talk about the cross. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about judgment. This is right down the line from Isaiah. Watch. Trusted in the shadow of Egypt instead of God. That's the might of Egypt. Believed they'd escape the overflowing scourge of God's punishment. Isaiah sought to turn them back to God. So, he talks about the coming Messiah. Saw the glory and spoke of him. His birth and divine presence. There's the Isaiah account and the fulfillment of scripture next to it, Matthew. His Davidic heritage, his forerunner, his glory, his power and good things. He talked about his shepherd-like love, his ministry and his work, his Galilean ministry. He actually talks about in Isaiah chapter 9. His sufferings and death, his victory over death, his foundation stone, his house, his eternal throne, his plan for Gentiles, and his new name for his people. Isaiah is giving you the entire Bible, by the way. So let me give you the Messianic prophecies. He will be born of a virgin. Isaiah tells us that. He will cause those who don't believe in him to stumble. His ministry will begin in Galilee. Can you imagine that? Isaiah talks about God's, Jesus' ministry beginning in Galilee. His kingdom will last forever. He will be a descendant of Jesus, David. Of Jesse, excuse me, David. He will be followed by Gentiles. That's us. He, will be, he saw us. He will be considered the chief cornerstone. Jesus called himself the. He will heal the sick. He will be preceded by a messenger. This is Isaiah. It's unbelievable, this book. He will be humble, yet bring forth justice. He will endure people spitting on him and beating him. He will be rejected and despised. He will suffer. He will be punished and die for our sins. He will not defend himself. He will be buried with the rich. He will be anointed by God's Spirit. He will minister in public. Isaiah. So, as I get close to closing, uh, um, his message is all about turning back to God. Man, if I think anything I, today, it's about turning back to God. Tonight, our prayers as a nation, as a body of Christ, as individuals, should be this. I need you to soften my heart, to break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. Because God is. He's shaping our lives. There's a reason why you're in this study tonight. There's a reason why you're going to study Isaiah. You know, you cannot go away from here t tonight or any other night thinking, well, I heard that and I understand Isaiah. No. This is going to lay a burden on your life. This is going to lay a burden on you to understand you've got to pray for America just like you pray for Israel. You've got to pray for God's protection. And it, whether it's your family or whether it's people you work with, you've got to pray for them to come back around to God. I'm not saying you have to go to them and beat them over the head. As a matter of fact, I'm saying you don't have to do that. What you have to do is pray for them to do that because you, because you already have a voice that's telling us to do this. You're studying this for a reason. There's a reason why you are here tonight. This is a divine appointment for every single one of you here tonight. It's not because you're used to coming and hearing Pastor Mark. God's laying something on you and he's going to lay a burden on you. And that burden is not going to be a hard burden. It's going to be a burden of a, burden of, of, uh, a calling. It's going to be a fire calling. And, but you're going to have a hope through that burden because the whole end of Isaiah is powerful. It's all about hope and it's all about Christ and all about God coming to our rescue. So, our prayers need to be that. Isaiah would have, would have loved what St. Augustine said 1,100 years uh, later. He said, Come, Lord, stir us up and call us back. Kindle and seize us. Be our fire and our sweetness. Let us love and let us run. So I want to leave you tonight with the truth from Isaiah's mouth and all of this judgment that he gives. And we're going to have to go through the judgment. It's okay. It's going to sound tough, but we have to go through it. But in all the judgment, he gives us so many powerful truths and so many things we can lean on. This is the one I want to give you with tonight. Nothing can stop God's plan for your life. Isaiah 14, 27. God's got a plan for your life. Part of that plan, believe it or not, is you being here tonight. Part of that plan is you in your word. 
How does your faith grow? By hearing the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. So how will it benefit you and how will it benefit me to talk about tough things? Well, it will benefit us because there's always an answer to the tough things. You know, I give in the news every week. I give it two places. And I always want to tell people, listen, this is the news. It's terrible. But your God's not terrible. Your God knows exactly what's going on and he has it all in his hands. So tonight, whether you're struggling personally or whether you're struggling on, on YouTube or on uh, Facebook, let me just ask us to stand. We're going to pray. And I'm going to ask us to repeat this together. And when we get to this, let's all stand. I want you to say this with me. And I'll say it first, and then I want you to repeat it with me. I want you to say it this way. Nothing can stop God's plan for my life. You ready? Nothing can stop God's plan for my life. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for your people. Lord, I thank you for Isaiah. Lord, what a boldness, Lord. What a calling, Lord God. A calling with giving us hope in the midst of, of a warning, Lord Jesus. And I thank you tonight, Lord God. Whatever we do with this entire study, Lord God, we have to personalize it and take it in. We must assimilate it, Lord God, and eat this book up that it would change us, Lord. Give us a mindset for what's happening in our world, Lord. Not a depressed mindset, but a mindset of saying there's someone that has to stand in the gap. And I pray tonight, Lord God, that you would touch our lips, you would touch our ears, Lord God, with the coals from off the fire. Lord, I thank you tonight that we are able ministers of your, of your message, Lord. Isaiah knew that he was undone, he was unclean. Lord, that's all of us tonight. None of us purport to be anything more than what we are. But Lord, we do want to see you be used in our lives. Bless us, Lord God. Let us remember that nothing can stop your plan for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.